last week. I just came back from a, a week-long retreat in the Mendocino Woods, um, a men's retreat with the Mosaic Multicultural Foundation, and it's got a lot of ritual and poetry and dance and music and initiatory things, and, um, and I'm, I'm still a little bit in that other world, so. But I have some stories, and whatever, maybe we can make something out of them. <laughs> the poet Muriel Ruckheiser said that the universe is made of stories, not atoms. <laughs> so. And what I'd like to speak about tonight, partly because I was so touched by it in the retreat that just passed, um, is sanctuary. Um, and sanctuary is a beautiful word that whose roots go back to um, the meaning of sacred, that which is sacred. And finding that which is sacred in a culture that can almost be defined as the absence of the sacred, much of popular and kind of commercial and the kind of culture that we see in a broad way, that perhaps the disease of the culture is the absence of the sacred. What does it mean to find sanctuary or reconnect with that which is sacred in a world that has madness and war and continuing insanity of racism, suffering of the prison systems and the medical systems and the ecological devastation and the various injustices that we know at the same time as the beauty of the world. I mean, how do we find our way in all of this? A few lines from Pablo Neruda, probably the greatest poet in Spanish ever, speaking about poetry. It was necessary to go on discovering, hungry with no one to guide me, to go on dissolving the iron in the soul until water finds a voice through your mouth to find a strange vocation that seeks you out and which goes into hiding when we look for it, a shadow with a broken roof and stars shining through its holes. And I start a little bit with the poetry because nobody quite understands what Neruda is talking about. <laughs> but something underneath that knows, you know, the broken roof with the stars shining through. And sanctuary is really central to Buddhist practice and tradition. To create sanctuary, which means to create a place, um, and the temples and the forest monasteries where I lived in Asia, to create a place um, that, where the heart is not in the thrall of greed and hatred and fear and ignorance. To have a ground where we step out of the poisons or the confusions or the toxins of the world and remember something else that's important for us. In a way, it's what meditation is. Wherever you put your cushion or your chair or your seat, it's as if you create a temple a sacred ground for yourself. <clears throat> when we began to build the retreat meditation hall, that beautiful building that many of you have probably been in, now that's been open for the last eight years, because we're in a class four, class five earthquake zone, which is of course California, right? So it's, um, they dug down these whole series of 40 foot holes into which steel rebar was put and then columns were poured for it to rest on and before we let the columns be poured we got these beautiful round river stones and covered them first with gold leaf and then wrote on them prayers in Sanskrit and Pali and English and all these beautiful prayers and placed them at the bottom of every column that was to be poured and then did all these chants so that they would support everything that happened as people came to practice in that building. When I lived in the forest monastery in Thailand, uh, initially in the Mekong River Valley, it, uh, it was during the period of the war in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. And um, 
Some of Ajahn Chah's monasteries where I was were close enough to the border. At night, you would see the planes going overhead. You'd see flashes from the bombs. You know, you could hear all the jets and <coughs> fighter, fighter planes. And um, I had a couple of friends who were working. I'd worked on medical teams in the Mekong River Valley, and they were working with the Quakers doing peace work um, in the villages in the highlands in Vietnam which was quite dangerous work. And they got pretty exhausted, and they came to the monastery to visit me. And at first they were kind of, I don't see what the right word is, somewhere between um, judgmental and disgusted. With <laughs> all these monks sitting around on their asses, as they said, when there's a war going on. Um, because war is um, filled with so much suffering and so much insanity, and people who are normally um, connected with one another um, break and destroy, the, you know, they'll tear their temples, they'll, they'll steal anything to get bread for their children, to get safety for themselves. All these things happen that are inhuman. And they said, you've got to do something. And they went to my teacher, Ajahn Shah, and he said, they said, you know, you've got to help stop the war. And he said, oh, I definitely want to stop the war. He said, that's the most important thing. But he said, I want to go to where the war starts. Mm -hmm. And he looked at them, and when he pointed here, it was hard. He said, this is where the war starts. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find the place to stop the war of hatred and fear and prejudice and cruelty and racism and greed in here, then that war out there will never stop. So they had a little bit of an argument, <laughs> which was interesting, you know. And they stayed at the temple for a time. And um, after a few days, they began to get quiet and soften a little bit, because they were out of the conflict in Vietnam. And by the end of their visit, by the end of the week, we sat down and talked. And they said, you know, this is, this is kind of remarkable because we understand a bit better now that temple was a sanctuary where if you lost your wallet, someone would pick it up and bring it to the altar and say, has anyone lost their wallet? Here's all the money in it, you know. It doesn't happen in a war zone, I'll tell you. You know, um, where the monks practiced stepping over the little trails of ants so that there was a reverence for every form of life. And that if anyone needed anything, can we help you? And the teachings in the temple of compassion and fearlessness and wakefulness were offered freely to anybody who came in. We will take you in and give you sanctuary. And what they began to see was that it was a, a living library, um, like the great library of Alexandria in the ancient days. It was a living ground that reminded people of what was possible for us as humans, even with the madness around. This is a description of sanctuary to begin with, but it's really the description of the sanctuary of our meditation as well, when we begin to sit. So I returned last night from this men's retreat, um, and the, this is about the 30th year of this, these men's gatherings uh, deep in the ancient redwood forests in Mendocino, far, far in the, into the woods. And I've been going for more than 20 years. And um, it's a combination. We have various elders who teach, African medicine man, people who've studied with the Tarahumara and the Mayans and, you know, Japanese martial arts and poetry and dance and all kinds of things. Um, and uh, it's an old CCC camp made in the 1930s under Roosevelt, the Civilian Conservation Corps, these rough cabins in this very rough hewn lodge. And there's only two of the CCC camps that are still left operating in America, Mendocino Woodlands Camp and Camp David, Maryland. Um, so we see ourselves as the anti-Camp David. <laughs> And for my work there, we made a temple for some of the men, of these hundred men who were there, young and old, 
in a grove of redwood trees, we cleared the ground of about 40 feet and hung a red silk banner down a tree and then made an altar up from stones from the stream and uh, moss on top that we gathered and ferns. It was really beautiful, like a Japanese altar. And we sat under these trees um, and there were young guys. This is a group of men that includes a whole bunch of young men from the inner cities, guys from Watts and East Los Angeles and Chicago and Oakland coming with mentors who are helping young men get out of the gangs. Um, and really, they're, what they are, many of them, is child soldiers in a war in the streets. So here we are sitting, 20, 30 guys or more under these redwood trees in my meditation group, and one guy sits quietly, said, I never sat under trees like this before. And he closes his eyes, he said, I can't do it. I said, what happens? He says, I keep seeing, you know, my sister going to the door because my older brother was in the gangs and they came to get my older brother and she went out the door. Mm. And I, I went to say, don't open the door. And while I was watching, she was shot and killed. Mm. He said, and I closed my eyes and I meditate. I was nine years old mm. while I was watching. My son. And I don't, he said, I don't know. He said, I don't know what to do with that anymore. What do you do with that? I find these retreats very, very difficult to teach. I mean, sitting up there with Luis Rodriguez, who's this wonderful Latino poet who wrote um, Always Running, My Gang Days in L.A., which is this fantastic bestseller, you know, and Michael Mead, who's done all this stuff in the streets and in the prisons and stuff, and people ask me questions about this stuff, and I'm going, wait a second, I don't know. Um, actually, I get really nervous. My wife says, this is good for you. You know, you, you sit in front of all these people and you have this nice role where everybody thinks that you know what you're doing. <laughs> Go up there and get humbled. And I do every time, you know. I mean, it's, it's very, very real. Um, so the young men started to speak, and it was like the speakers for the dead. Because part of our forgiveness ritual was to go down to the stream and get stones for people that you've lost or people that you've harmed. And these young men went, would go down to the stream and they were singing this African song and they kept bringing stones. One stone after another, you know. Fifteen guys I know who died in my gang in the last seven years. Now, no young person is supposed to know fifteen dead people. And most of them were young. Um, so it was a sanctuary. I mean, one of these guys stood up and he said, Man, all these people I've been talking about, what's going on? All these people are coming up to me and telling me they appreciate me. I never had anybody say they appreciate me my whole life. I don't know what to do with that. You know, but he's smiling while he's saying it. And it was really beautiful to see. Simone Weil, mystic who writes, the danger is not that the soul should doubt whether there is any bread, but that by a lie it should persuade itself that it is not hungry. And somehow to be to survive this, these guys got so tough that they forgot that they wanted to be appreciated and loved like any anybody else. And so all these stories started pouring out, amazing stories. And of course, as there, these 25 young people's story came out, then the other 75 people, you know, the businessmen and the yoga teachers and the students and the musicians and the doctors, and everybody started talking about how hard it is to be human. Because it's not just them. Divorce and <coughs> the stresses of life and loneliness and depression and abuse and the madness of the world. And then we would sit and have a song under these trees together. And the story that Michael Mead, the drummer and mythologist who helps run it, told was this great long myth. Sometimes he'll tell Vedic Indian myths like from the Mahabharata, sometimes Irish myths. It was this great long myth, a kind of initiation journey of this young young man filled with failures. He kept getting thrown, keeps getting thrown in dungeons and falls down the well and makes mistakes and steals and gets caught and so forth. And each time he gets caught, all the young men in the room are listening, how's he going to get out of it this time, you know? But it's not just them. Zen Master Dogen said that 
A Zen master's life is one continuous mistake. <laughs> because we all have failures. And if you look in the Buddhist teachings, one of the most, um, the favorite story in all of the Himalayas and all of Tibetan Buddhism, and Nepal and Tibet and India, is the story of Milarepa, this great mm -hmm. saint who was initially um, went to find his teacher because he had killed all these people. And he, he, he was... Um, terrified for the karma that he'd made. Um, and he went to find this great old lama in the mountains who put him through a long series of trials and purification and initiation. And when he got through, he was the best of all teachers because he really knew the capacity of the human heart both to make difficulty and sorrow and mistakes, huge mistakes sometimes, and to be redeemed and to find a freedom anyway. And these were the kind of stories that we told to these young men. It's like the Truth and Reconciliation, you know, council in South Africa or something, where people would come in and tell their stories um, and find forgiveness. When one enters a great temple, a forest monastery, a sanctuary. What it does is it invites something different than our ordinary consciousness. Thomas Merton, great Catholic mystic, says the apparent pointless of the pointlessness of the monastery in the eyes of the world is exactly what it gives it a reason for existing. In a world of noise, confusion, conflict, of continuing war and racism and fear from one another. It is necessary that there be places of silence, of inner discipline and peace, not the peace of relaxation, but the peace of inner clarity and love based on true compassion. In a world of tension and breakdown, it's necessary for there to be those who seek to integrate their lives, not by avoiding anguish and running away from problems, but by facing it all in its naked reality and utter ordinariness. For this is the training of life. And in some way, we all need sanctuary because the world is hard for each of us in, in its own way. And sanctuary means a place to be reconnected with our true self, with what the Zen koan says, with who you are, before your parents were born. <laughs> With the mystery of coming into this body, into this incarnation. I mean, how did you get in here? You have this body, but you don't think you are this body, do you? I mean, you're wiser than that, I'm sure. Plus which, as I've said often, you look in the mirror and you notice how it's aged, right? <laughs> but you don't feel older. And that's because the body ages, but that's not who you are. And the witness, the, the one that sees, the one that knows. Ajahn Chah, my teacher, called it the one who knows. <laughs> Looks and says, wow, it's getting older, isn't it? <laughs> but who are you? What is this spirit underneath it all? And so when we come to meditate together, or come to do our practice, or when we create a place of stillness and meditation, it's a way of being reminded of stepping out of the stress and busyness and returning to that which is free in the heart and timeless. The freedom beyond gain and loss. Hafez says, The mind is ever a tourist wanting to touch and buy new things and then toss them into an already filled closet. <laughs> you know, and we get caught up in that. And then you sit down. There's a story of a great Sufi master who was sitting in India on the banks of the Ganges River, and a student came to him, a wealthy merchant, and he brought as a present, as an offering, sometimes you make an offering to a teacher when you begin, mostly to show your sincerity. And he brought as an offering these two enormous pearls and placed them at the feet of the guru. And the master picked them up and looked at them and said, they shine like the moon, don't they? Really beautiful. 
you know, and he kind of held it on his palm, and then it slipped off and rolled into the river. And the man's eyes got wide. He got really freaked out. Wait, I mean, this incredibly valuable pearl, and it just dropped over the bank into the river, and he starts fishing around and trying to find it. And he says, Master, did you see exactly where it went? <laughs> And the master took the second pearl and he threw it. <laughs> you understand, huh? That there has to be some place where things don't count. The kind of things we count. And where we step out of the time... Aldous Huxley, Huxley says, an idolatrous religion is one in which time is substituted for eternity. Future time and the idea of endless progress is the devil's work, demanding human sacrifice on an enormous scale. And so to come to sanctuary is really to come back to ourselves. And remember who we are, or what our love is, our deepest love, or our purpose or our values. And it's not so much about getting something as about shedding or letting go, having a beginner's mind again, because you already know this. Now, it's so mysterious. We travel all over the world, and I'm one who has, you know, up to Tibet and down to Machu Picchu and you name it. Well, okay, all these amazing places in Egypt and things like that. Um, looking for freedom. <laughs> but of course, it doesn't work that way. So, there's a story, one of the faces of uh, Diana, or Artemis, in Greek mythology, is Daphne. And Daphne is the one, the, this young woman, who lived deep in the woods away from civilization, and was absolutely free, and went through the trees with this beautiful, incredible spirit, often seen running through the trees as a huntress singing. And because of the freedom of her spirit, Apollo fell in love with her. You know, that happens all the time in the Greek, Greek myths, not to speak of other times, right? And we are, there's this beauty to freedom, and you want to kind of capture it in some way. So Apollo fell in love with her and pursued her tried to convince her, and she would run away, Daphne. Because she didn't want to fall in love with anybody but herself, but the spirit of freedom itself. And finally she started to, you know, go off in her singing, dancing, and Apollo was getting closer and closer, and she ran, and he almost caught up to her, and she came to the river, and her father was the god of the river, and she cried out to the god of the river, to her father. And he sang a song from the river, and she sprouted roots and turned into this beautiful tree that stood by the river. It's the end of that little story. Now, sometimes we need to run to be free, and it's a beautiful thing to find a way to run free in the woods. But sometimes, maybe, when we all have that song of Daphne in us that wants to run free, but sometimes maybe also we just have to put down roots and stop, let ourselves stop being pursued by anything and say, all right, this is the place where I am. This is the place where I sit on the earth. This is the place of my roots, and I will be here. And there's a freedom in that as well. Now, I'm talking about something that's hard to talk about because it's of the spirit and it's of that which is mysterious and it's of the consciousness that was born into your body. Um, so you don't see it a lot on the television, you know, and in the marketplace and so forth. It's more mysterious than that. Sometimes I go about pitying myself. Everyone's heard this now. It's such a beautiful saying from the Ojibwe Indian. Sometimes I go about pitying myself when all the while I'm being carried by great winds across the sky. And so, yes, there's our plans and the things we're involved in, and we need to do that. But underneath, there's something more mysterious unfolding 
in your life. And to feel that, to sit in your sanctuary and get still and listen, is to feel some bigger current than just the day-to-day -day things of our life. <coughs> Another story for you. I'm not sure quite how it fits, but I like it. And it's a little bit mysterious, and it's a little bit of a surprise. And it's about <coughs> Makeda, whose <coughs> other name was the Queen of Sheba. Remember the Queen of Sheba in the Bible? Because she went to visit King Solomon. And uh, one of the beautiful things about the Queen of Sheba was that she was a lover of wisdom. And she heard that Solomon was the wisest man on earth, as well, along with being a great king. <clears throat> and she decided that she would pay him a visit. Um, and of course, this is a, this is a literal story that, that apparently happened, but it's also a mythological story in its own way. And the Queen of Sheba came from, from East Africa, from Ethiopia. She was the Abyssinian queen. And this story is told in the Abyssinian Bible. And she was known to be a great beauty and a wise woman and a grand heart and tremendous strength. <coughs> and when she came to see Solomon, she came with her attendants and elephants and camels and chests full of jewels and gold. It wasn't like, you know, all the people who are coming into the court of Solomon to beg and, you know, plead for his, you know, his blessings. It was really a meeting of equals. And then she came to test Solomon to see if he was as wise as he was said to be. And I sometimes think about it and imagine that it was also probably lonely to be the queen, you know, as it can be lonely to be the king. And to find somebody who is your match, who you can talk to. So here comes the queen of Abyssinia. And she stayed for six months. And they had a conversation for six months, apparently, in this, as the story is told. And it was really a heart conversation, and a spirit conversation, and a conversation of leadership, and a conversation of poetry. But even though Solomon had, how many wives was it? Four hundred? I forget what they said. Anyway. <laughs> She never went to bed with Solomon, um, which was not his choice. <laughs> you know how those things go. But on the last night before she was to leave, Solomon entreated her to rest in his royal bedchamber. And she agreed, but only if he would not force his affections upon her. Obviously, they'd fallen in love in some fashion or other. And he said, yes, he would do so but only if she would agree to one small favor from him, that she would not steal or take anything of value from his house without permission. She said, why would I ever do that? I have everything. So prior to their banquet, and the, I mean prior to their, to their night in the bedchamber, Solomon had this great banquet um, arrayed as a kind of, last evening's gesture, and he made sure to talk to the cook in the kitchen and fill the foods with salt and spices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after the banquet was over, and the poems were spoken, and the finest of wines were poured, and the celebration of the wisdom and beauty of both in the court, they retired to the bedchamber, and they both went to sleep. And then sometime in the middle of the night, the queen woke up and took the pitcher of water next to the bed and poured a glass. She was so thirsty from this very salty food. And Solomon, who hadn't been sleeping, but waiting, <laughs> sat up and said, you didn't ask me for the water. She said, but I was thirsty, it's water. And he said, but here we are in this great desert and, O oh, Queen, is, is not water the most precious thing in the desert? <laughs> Here you've taken this without asking. Anyway, she went back to Ethiopia and bore Solomon a son. <laughs> <laughs> and that became the royal line that ended in, I don't know when it was, in 1965 or 70. Haile Selassie was the last king of that royal, the Lion of Judah was the last of the, the great-great-grandsons of the Queen of Sheba. Um, 
So to be too practical and literal about it doesn't work either. It doesn't. There's something more mysterious that goes on in life. And some of it only is known when we get still. When we go into the great trees of the forest. Or we take time in the morning before going out into the middle of, you know, the day of our adventures and sit quietly and listen to our own hearts and to the rhythm of our life inside. One physician named David talked about being an intern and then a doctor at the San Francisco General Hospital on the AIDS ward back in the old days. And it was years ago during the beginning of the AIDS epidemic before all the protease inhibitors and the, you know, drug therapies were available. And almost all his patients who were admitted to the service died. Mm. Many of them were young men quite close in age to his own, people whose lives mattered deeply to him. And after a time, he became overwhelmed by a sense of futility and felt that way for months and months working there. Now, David also happens to be trained as a Buddhist. And it's been his practice to offer prayers for each of his patients. And when a patient dies, even now, he lights a candle on his altar and keeps it burning for 49 days. And for the whole time he was at San Francisco General, he prayed for each dying young man and lit a candle on his altar for them. And now years afterward, he tells this story with a wistful smile because it's made him wonder. Perhaps the reason he was there was not what he thought. He had expected to serve them by curing and rescuing every patient. But when their problems proved resistant to his modern medical expertise, he'd felt useless. But maybe he was not meant to be there to cure people. Perhaps, he said, he was there so that no one would die without someone to pray for them. Perhaps he had served every one of his patients flawlessly. I've had the privilege of doing hospice work at different times over the years, many times. And when I sit with someone who's dying, there isn't really that much to say. I mean, sometimes we have a conversation. The questions that come at the end of life are pretty simple ones. Did I love well? Maybe that's the only question. Maybe did I live fully? Did I love? Maybe they're the same thing somehow to offer your love to the world. Not a lot of things to say. And I might sit and meditate or chant with that person and so forth. But it's not about fixing or doing or making. It's really about being in the presence of this mystery into which we are born and meeting it with an open heart, beginner's mind. Because when we do, then something of beauty comes out of us. It wants to come out of us. And part of what's mysterious and why a place like Spirit Rock or wherever you find as a sanctuary is important is that there are two dimensions to our being. In the Buddhist tradition, they're talked about the two truths, sometimes the relative and absolute, which is a very bad translation. The universal and the personal is a much better translation. And what it means is that you have to remember your Buddha nature and your zip code. <laughs> and if you forget either one, you're in trouble. I mean, you do need to know your social security number, and you have to drive on the right-hand side of the road, and you have to engage in the world, and it's part of living your incarnation, to do it and do it with some dignity and elan and ease and, you know, fall down the well and get in the dungeons and do that and pick yourself back up, but make something in the world. You have to do that. But you can't make anything of value if you forget your Buddha nature, if you forget what, who you really are and what you have to offer this world. In another culture, in another mythological language, it's called the two agreements, that when you're born and you come into this world, you come with a purpose with, or with a gift, if you will, with something that's uniquely yours to bring into this world, and no one has ever brought the gifts of your 
particular life and being into this world before. And then you ha look around and you say, wow, I got this family, right, and this neighborhood, and this culture, and this country, and so forth. And you realize you sort of have to negotiate a lot of agreements with them, what kind of a child you'll be, and you know, how you deal with the school, or the, or the economic system, and so forth. Those are all called the second agreement. And you have to find your way through those. You can't not do it. But they're not the first agreement. The first agreement is the agreement of the spirit or the soul or whatever language you want to use that comes into this world with some gift to give, something to do. And if you do all those other second agreement things, you know, and get it all together outwardly and forget the first one, it's, you're, you're not happy, you're not satisfied, you're not fulfilled. It's as if the king or queen has given you this great errand to do and you go across the seas and you go to this other kingdom and you find all these people and adventures and do all these things and you forget the main errand that you went to do and then you come back and they say, well, did you do it? <laughs> and in some way you have a great errand as a human being on the earth and as a unique human being with your particular beauty and gifts and wisdom and compassion and understanding this is your root of nature, to bring it out in some fashion. And without that, you won't be happy. So what a sanctuary does is it offers a place to remember in the midst of all this, to reconnect with what we really know and love and care about. And it doesn't mean it's easy. Zen Master Ryokan, the most beloved of all the poets of Japan, he writes, the vicissitudes of this world are like the movements of the clouds. Fifty years of life are but one long dream. Sparse rain in my desolate hermitage at night, quietly I clutch my robe, and lean against the empty window, lonely, dizzy, nothing here but dreams. So he, 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 he writes, you know, or crickets disturbed by my unexpected visit, shriek, looking up I see the setting sun, unbearable loneliness. That's one of his poems, you know, and then on the other hand, he writes, spring morning, the children and I go out to pick vegetables, what could be more wonderful? Playing in a garden among the cherry trees, my sleeves covered with blossoms, the children laughing, the flowers fall like snow on the earth. And Ryokan celebrates all of it. He takes his sanctuary there, and he says there's loneliness and love and longing and connection and birth and death and the 10,000 joys and sorrows. And in the midst of it, you sense that he is that he's found his place in it all, that his heart is open to it all, and that he's true to himself in the midst of it, in this beautiful way, that he is free. So what is your sanctuary? You can go up into the mountains and the Sierras, <clears throat> walk by the ocean, take time alone. Those are the outer forms of sanctuary. Come to a retreat. But as Nelson Mandela said, we are not yet free. We have merely achieved the freedom to be free. We have all these outward capacities for freedom. But what does it mean to find this place of freedom within yourself, freedom with joy and sorrow, with gain and loss, the freedom to love in the middle of it all. And when you come to meditate, the line from Rumi, he writes, pay regular visits to yourself. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. And meditation isn't about getting some state, okay, I'm going to sit and breathe and open the chakras and raise the kundalini and have this light, and, you know, open this and have this fabulous vision and then open like this guy and 
Hold it. Okay, I got it. Fantastic. <laughs> <sighs> but after a while, you know, you get stuck even there. You have to breathe. <sighs> okay, it opens and it closes. And my teacher, Ajahn Shah, said, if you haven't wept deeply, you probably haven't really learned to meditate yet. Doesn't mean that everyone has to weep all the time, but we carry the tears of the world with us. We do. And we carry the love of the world with us. And the tears need to be wept and the love needs to be felt. Not for anybody else and not because you need to do it. That's not quite the right word. But because the soul needs to do it, the heart, the spirit, in order to fulfill the gift that you've been given of your life and to bring something beautiful into this world. So you sit in meditation and instead of stopping the feelings and thoughts and so forth, you bow to each one. Oh, yes, this too. And you step out of the body of fear, the small sense of self, and become the ground, the, the temple, the sanctuary yourself, the guest house, and say, oh, yes, you too, and you too. And here I am, like the Buddha, under the tree of enlightenment, saying, yes, this too. And here I am, still heart open with compassion in the midst of it all. Ajahn Chah called it being the one who knows, for finding your true home. Touching something that's bigger than the things we get caught up in our day-to-day -day experience. Now it's also true that in finding sanctuary and refuge and returning home, that while we need to do it in our own unique way, we need one another. It's a kind of funny thing. Again, you know, like remembering your Buddha nature and your zip code, there's a certain way in which you need to face your aloneness and despair all by yourself. Nobody else can do it for you. And at the same time, we need each other desperately. And we can't completely do it alone. Isn't that also true? What story to read? Oh, this one, just because it's fun, even though I read it recently. From Fran Peavy, activist and friend. One day I was walking through the Stanford University campus with a friend and saw a crowd of people with cameras and video equipment on a little hillside. They were clustered around a pair of chimpanzees, the male running loose and the female on a chain about 25 feet long. It turned out the male was from Marine World Africa and the female was being studied for something or other at Stanford and who I thought were the spectators were actually scientists and publicity people trying to get them to mate. <laughs> the male was eager, you know how that goes. He grunted and grabbed the female's chain and tugged. She whimpered and backed away. He pulled again. She pulled back. Watching the chimps' faces, I began to feel sympathy for the female. Suddenly, the female chimp yanked her chain out of the male's grasp, and to my amazement, she walked through the crowd straight over to me and took my hand. <laughs> then she led me across the circle to the only other two women in the crowd, and she joined hands with us. And the three of us stood together in a circle. I remember the feeling of that rough palm against mine. The little chimp had recognized us and reached out across all the years of evolution to form her own women's support group. <laughs> so there is the finding of sanctuary, and at the same time there's also the sanctuary that we offer to one another. My friend Annie Lamott puts it this way, she says, my mind is like a bad neighborhood, I try not to go there alone. <laughs> so when I was in Hawaii on the island of on the island of Hawaii in the Big Island, um, when I go there on the Kona side, I like to go and visit this place called Pua Honua Ohonau now, which is the Hawaiian name for the temple or city of refuge. And you go down this long road down to the beach, and it's a black lava beach, the sand is black, and this ten foot wide lava wall around it, and the pools for the ali'i, for the noblemen, the king and queens, 
and the little temples. And what's sad of Pua Honua um, is it's the temple of refuge and forgiveness that no matter what you did in the ancient Hawaiian culture, if you killed someone or you broke the worst taboo, if you could find your way into that temple, you would be forgiven. And of course, get in there and the question is, does it still work? You know, can I, can I also avail myself of this place? And you've, it has a great power to it. So a few, some years ago, um, the group of men in Mendocino in one of our camps, one of our years, decided when we had finished our week that we were going to carry some redwoods down to Watts. There was guys from Watts in East Los Angeles, and to plant a grove of redwoods and put an elder's bench in the middle of the community for people to start to make village again mm -hmm. where things had been so torn apart. There was an empty lot across from Drew Medical School, which had been, been, been the beginning spot of the L.A. riots or insurrection years before. And so we got all these young men and older men together in our trucks and buses and whatever, went down to L.A. We had these four redwood trees and a bench, and we'd called a number of elders. I called a Native American that I knew, and some Sri Lankan monks came and so forth. We were going to do this beautiful ritual. And when we came to bring the trees and the bench and this ground, we made a kind of archway that you would come in out of redwoods and then filled it with flowers. And these young men were there welcoming people. But as we got there, we found out that two of the members of this group that was coming out of the gangs, there are different groups, homeboy industries, youth struggling for survival, um, had, who hadn't come on our retreat, had been shot in a drive-by shooting while we were away and killed. So it was terrible grief in the community, these two beautiful young men. And we said, well, we can't do a place of peace with this much grief and anger and suffering here. We have to attend to that first. And tried to figure out what to do. And finally decided to dig a big hole in the ground right before the gate that was there. We dug, got some shovels and dug this big hole, looking at ancient rituals, really. And then on the other part of that lot, there was a pile of rock. And we carried over got a car, it's a trunk, carried over a whole big pile of these stones. And then as people came to the gate, there was one Latino guy, and one black, one white guy, one young Asian guy, these four men were there would bow to you and say, welcome to the grove of elders and youth of peace that we are um, planting here in the middle of in the heart of the community. Um, if you carry in your heart anything that is not peaceful, anything that still pains you greatly, that you need to let go of before entering this place, we invite you, if you wish, to take a stone and place that conflict, that fear, that pain, that anger, place that into the earth in this hole that we've dug. And there were a couple of men that stood there almost like priests who would take it and offer forgiveness for that. And we thought a few people might do it. Everybody did it. Everybody took a stone there. They were holding these broken rocks, right? And hold, held them for a while and thought about all the things that they needed to let go of in order to enter a sanctuary, a place of peace. And finally they would put their stones down in the hole. And I had this thought that if we dug a hole on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles <laughs> and put a couple of, you know open-hearted men or women by it, that you would have a line, you know, of 50,000 people long coming to let go of things and be forgiven and bury things in the earth. Because we all have that. And there's this great need. Part of what a sanctuary offers in the Buddhist temple, there's this sacred boundary called a sema that's made where the monks or the nuns will sit in every square, every, you know, four foot square of the earth, one after another and another, doing prayers of forgiveness before anyone's invited in. It's a kind of sacred boundary or sacred ground. And people make their rituals of prayers and confessions and forgiveness and practices to step out of shame, to step out of errors and 
mistakes and the dungeons that you've found yourself in and realize that it's never ever too late to start again to remember your first agreement to remember who you really are what you're here to do to listen to the heart and begin again in New York there was a man who was kind of a performance artist, um, called himself Mr. Apology. And he set up, in the old days, an 800 number that you could call um, if you wanted to apologize for anything. <laughs> and you know how our culture is. It's a weird culture, you have to admit. And he started getting not just hundreds, but thousands of calls with people apologizing for stuff. You know? Apologize and you will for be be, be forgiven. And there were people who'd done all kinds of crimes, and so he said some of the floods of coal, some of the stories were terribly poignant, you know. But even that, even with in this kind of bizarre mechanical way, as an art project, it had meaning. Because we need to find a way to release the past, all the things that we've judged ourselves for, to learn from it, and to make something new again from our heart. And a true sanctuary is a place of mercy and forgiveness as well as truth. From South Africa, we want to forgive. This is from Bongani Finga, who was one of the judges, if you will, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. He said, but in spite of the atrocities after what happened under apartheid. People came forth and gave testimony. We want to forgive. I remember hearing the testimony of the daughter of one of the four men from Craddock, who in 1985 were abducted and murdered and burned. And the girl was 16 years old. And she said, I want to forgive, but I do not know whom to forgive. If only I could know and see who did this to my father and look them in the eye, then I could forgive. I would like to do so. And it was such a moving testimony by a young person who at that age we might expect to be so bitter, but there was not bitterness. So often the responses of the victims to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission were just amazing. It's an indication of the fact that the people who have suffered most can still become generous in spirit. We can all do so. So sanctuary is a place of mercy and of truth-telling. And I'm told it used to be that near every large community in the world there were temples, there were sanctuaries. The Dalai Lama wants to make the whole of Tibet into a sanctuary. He wants to make the Tibet the first uh, weapons-free nation on the face of the earth where there would not be a single weapon in Tibet. If he could go back in, that's his wish. But imagine the sanctuaries, if there were, in Darfur, in Gaza, in Israel, you know, and in our cities, in Afghanistan. And I think part of the beauty of some of the churches that become real sanctuaries is that. You too shall pass away, says the Buddha, knowing this, how can you still quarrel? Reflect for a moment. What returns you back? What is your sanctuary? What are your sanctuaries? What brings you back to this Buddha nature, to this deep knowing, to the one who knows, to freedom in the midst of it all, no matter what you've done? When despair grows in me, says Wendell Berry, and I wake in the middle of the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things 
who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. And for a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. sweet to sit with the cricket sound, mm -hmm. <coughs> to have so many people together and hear the, hear the crickets. <coughs> so before we go out into this warm summer evening, or maybe cooler out there and then we're here unfortunately, I want us to do a very simple chant, one word, so it's not going to take a lot of study on your part. Um, in India, when you meet someone, you put your hands together and the greeting is namaste, which means I honor the divine within you. I see who you really are. And I love India. I love traveling in India because um, the culture so much carries the sense of the sacred <coughs> buried in everything, shining in everything. And the root of the word namaste in Sanskrit or in Pali is the word namo, which means to bow to or to honor. It's the first word in many Buddhist texts. So I'd like us to chant Namo nine times. And as you do, you can feel what it is you'd like to bow to. To the crickets, you know, to the tears that you carry, to the beauty of this summer evening that we share, to people that you know and love inwardly you can offer a bow, to places of sorrow and difficulty that you pay your respects and offer your attention, your care. We'll chant nine times and then go out into the, into the darkness. And um, when you go out there, because there are a lot of us, please drive politely. <laughs> you know, we have, I myself trained for some years, I was a taxi driver in Boston, I drove a yellow cab, and I made a lot of very bad driving habits, you know, so it takes a little mindfulness to come. Anyway, so let us chant. No.
may you find your true sanctuary, and may you become a sanctuary for those around you and for this earth. Thank you. Good night. Take your time in the parking lot. <laughs>